Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we're heading back to Inglewood Park Cemetery to find such stars as LaWanda Page, Big Mama Thornton, Hoot Gibson, Cleo Moore, and many more. Join us, won't you? One of the very first cemeteries we visited way back in 2017 was Inglewood Park Cemetery. Six years ago, if you can believe it, that baby-faced kid you saw in the intro cameo hadn't even started going gray yet. We found some big stars here, like Ray Charles, Ella Fitzgerald, Betty Grable, Etta James, and Cesar Romero, but Inglewood is a massive cemetery, and we only skimmed the surface of the stories to be told from these grounds. Inglewood has long been on my radar for a revisit, so we're back today to find some more entertainers and other historical figures that call Inglewood their eternal home. This area has grown since our first visit. Just across the street from the cemetery you can now see the new SoFi Stadium, home to the LA Rams and Chargers. And you'll also recall that Inglewood is the cemetery you fly over when landing at LAX. We'll begin our tour today just in from the entrance on the right in Sequoia section. Not far in from the road we find James J. Jeffries. He was a boxer in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, becoming world heavyweight champion in 1899. Jeffries was known for his strength and stamina, able to absorb punishing blows to wear his opponents down. He would retire undefeated in 1905, but come out of retirement as the Great White Hope in 1910 for the original fight of the century to attempt to reclaim the title from Jack Johnson. It would come to be one of the most consequential boxing matches in history. A white man and a black man duking it out for the championship highlighted the tense race relations in Jim Crow America. Jack Johnson defeated Jeffries, the only man to beat him, and was the first black heavyweight champion of the world. A black man defeating a white man did not sit well with many Americans, and after the fight, numerous race riots broke out across the country, leading to multiple deaths, mainly of black people celebrating their champion's victory. There were even some efforts by some cities and states to ban the exhibition of the film of the fight to try and censor Johnson's victory. But for his part, Jim Jeffries was gracious in his defeat and praised Johnson's greatness after the fight. Jeffries would take his skills to the screen as well, in films like One Round Hogan. James J. Jeffries died from a heart attack caused by a coronary thrombosis at age 77. Just across the street is Sunset Mission Mausoleum. Heading into Sanctuary El Sereno, about halfway in on the right we find the crypt of Richard Berry. He was a musician, a singer and songwriter associated with 50s doo-wop groups like the Flares and the Robins. His biggest claim to fame is as the composer and original performer of the rock standard Louie Louie. Louie, Louie. Da, 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 the song would later be famously covered by the Kingsmen, which sparked an FBI investigation into the perceived but non-existent obscenity in the mostly unintelligible lyrics. Louie Louie has since become one of the most recorded songs in rock history. Barry also had a hit in the song Have Love Will Travel. He continued to perform until shortly before his death at age 61 from heart failure. Back out to Sequoia section in front of the mausoleum near the Eastern Road is the grave of Margaret Booth. She was one of the great film editors in the early days of Hollywood. In an age when cutters, as they were known, were held in little regard, Margaret helped elevate the craft of film editing to drive the narrative and seamlessly flow through shots and scenes. In doing so, she's said to be the first cutter to be referred to as a film editor. Her career began in the silent era, and her best work came in the 1930s for MGM. She was nominated for an Academy Award for editing the 1935 film Mutiny on the Bounty. Later Margaret would be promoted to supervising editor, overseeing the edits of some of the great films of the age, including The Wizard of Oz, Gigi, and Annie. In 1978 Margaret was given an honorary Academy Award for her exceptional contribution to the art of film editing in the motion picture industry. She lived to be 104. Also buried here in the family plot is Margaret's brother, Elmer Booth. He was an actor during the silent era. He was one of the rising stars of this era, best known for starring in D.W. Griffith's The Musketeers of Pig Alley, considered by many as the first gangster flick. 
His smooth anti-hero approach to the character would set the stage for gangsters of the next generation like Cagney and Robinson. But his career was cut short when he died in an accident in 1915 at age 32. He was a passenger in a car driven by future director Todd Browning when the car collided with a train. D.W. Griffith delivered the graveside eulogy for Elmer. Still in this same section, a little further west, is the grave of actress Lois Hall. Her memorable film roles include as Sister Constance in Dead Again, and Tikura in Daughter of the Jungle. She was also known as a leading lady in B-movie westerns like Colorado Ambush. Lois would go on to make numerous television appearances as well, in shows like The Cisco Kid and Six Feet Under. She died from a heart attack and stroke at age 80. Let's cross the street southwest to A Plot. Here is the unmarked grave of Fred Kohler. He was considered one of the great heavies in early American film, an actor who played intimidating thugs, brutes, and villains. His career began in the silent era in films like The Iron Horse and Underworld. And he would go on to menace cowboy heroes in silent and sound westerns for decades in close to 150 productions. Fred was just 50 when he died from a heart attack in 1938. Hopping back across Sequoia section to Del Ivy section to the east, near the road, is the grave of Cleo Moore. The sultry starlet of the 50s silver screen was one of the era's many blonde bombshells. She rose to prominence starring in the Congo Bill serial in 1948. In the 50s she'd be positioned by the studio to be their next big star to compete with Marilyn Monroe in films like One Girl's Confession. for you gentlemen. I took the money and I'm ready to take the rap for it. So let's go. Other films include The Other Woman, Women's Prison, and Overexposed. But none could compete with Marilyn, and Cleo found her roles dictated more by her looks than her talent, and gradually diminished. She decided to retire from the screen in 1957. Cleo died in her sleep from a heart attack in 1973. Her birth year here is wrong, she was 48. Her fame has only grown posthumously, Cleo gaining something of a cult following as one of the great B-movie bad girls and pinups of the 50s. Let's hop back in the car and make our way around to Sunny Slope. Heading up said slope, we find the grave of Nacio Herb Brown. He was a composer of popular songs, film music, and theater music in the 20s to the 50s. He wrote music for MGM's first all-talking musical, The Broadway Melody, in 1929. Perhaps his best-known work is the music for the 1952 film, Singin' in the Rain, the title track having actually been written in 1929 and was the inspiration for the film. I'm singin' in the rain, just singin' in the rain. And for television, Nasio wrote themes for the shows Hopalong Cassidy and The Millionaire. He died from cancer at age 68, and years later was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Just around the corner is a beautiful monument that you've seen in a few of our past videos. Well, it's high time we introduced you to who this statue memorializes. This is the grave of Lillian Leitzel. Lillian was an acrobatic circus performer. She was born in Germany into a family of circus performers, and by 1910 made her way to the U.S. to perform. In 1915, she joined Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus, where she became a huge star. She was renowned for her high-flying performances on the rings, becoming known as the Aerial Wonder. She traveled the world performing for over a decade until tragedy struck. While performing in Copenhagen, Denmark, one of her rings snapped, and she fell 20 feet to the ground, landing on her back. She initially insisted she was alright, but two days later died from a concussion and complications from the fall. She was 39. Her husband Alfredo Cadona, a trapeze performer in the circus, was devastated. He had this monument to his beloved Lillian created. Into the monument are carved two rings, one of which is broken. The two figures are a winged Alfredo embracing his beloved Lillian. Alfredo also rests here. In addition to being a trapeze performer, he'd be Johnny Weissmuller's stunt double in a number of Tarzan films. 
By 1937 his high-flying career had ended due to an injury, and his marriage to his third wife was falling apart. While in a meeting with their lawyer over a division of property after the divorce, Cadona pulled out a gun, shot his wife, then shot himself. He died at the scene at 43. His wife died the next day. He was then buried here alongside his second wife, Lillian. Not far from here is a section known as Alta Mesa. In the western corner of the garden we find the crypt of the Rappin' Granny, real name Vivian Smallwood. She began rapping in the 80s and 90s and was signed to a record label. Years later she took her talents to America's Got Talent, competing in the 2006 season and making it through several rounds as one of the crowd favorites. Vivian was also an actress, known for playing Nano on Big Bad Beetleborgs, and making appearances on shows like Everybody Hates Chris and Parks and Recreation. She lived to be 84. Circling around again to the north, we arrive at the Capistrano Garden Mausoleum. Along the memorial panel to the right, we find Sunshine Sammy, real name Ernest Morrison. He made his film debut as a baby in 1916 when a producer who was an acquaintance with his father asked him to bring baby Ernest to set for a scene they needed to shoot, and thus a career was born. He continued to act prolifically through the silent era, including in two real comedies alongside the likes of Harold Lloyd and in the R Gang series. Sunshine Sammy is believed to be the first African American actor to sign a long-term contract in Hollywood when he signed on with Hal Roach Studio in 1919, and is considered Hollywood's first black child star. He'd become well known in the 40s as one of the East Side slash Dead End kids playing Scruno in more than a dozen films in the series. He retired from the screen in 1944, but made one more appearance on Good Times in 1974. Sunshine Sammy died from cancer at age 76. Not far from Sammy is the grave of Lawanda Page, real name Alberta Peel. Dubbed the Black Queen of Comedy, she's fondly remembered by fans of the 70s sitcom Sanford and Son as the hilarious Aunt Esther. Well, I'm sure not glad to see you, at least not in jail. Oh, God, you shut up, Esther. You just keep sucking on that sucker sucker. <laughs> and when I pull your chain, you bar. <laughs> Lawanda was also known for her stand-up and comedy albums, including the gold-selling Watch It, Sucker. Other television appearances include on Martin and Starsky and & Hutch, and her films include Shakes the Clown and Friday. Lawanda died from a heart attack at age 81. Continuing into this courtyard, we find T-Bone Walker, whose plaque seems to have gone missing. T-Bone ranks among the great guitarists of all time, He's particularly known as an innovator of jump blues and electric blues sounds. They call it Starry Monday. He played with many of the great jazz and blues artists of the era, touring and recording extensively. His 1969 album Good Feelin' would win him a Grammy. Walker was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987, which writes that T-Bone Walker was the first to make a guitar wail, cry out, and buckle under the weight of his emotion. T-Bone Walker died from pneumonia following a stroke in 1975 at the age of 64. I'm not sure what happened to his marker. There used to be one here, as this photo shows. Hopefully it will be replaced soon. Just east of here is the Mausoleum of the Golden West. When you visit, be sure to take a moment to soak in all the colorful light from the stained glass in the mausoleum. Heading into the Sanctuary of Faith, we find the crypt of Ferdy Grofay on the left. He was a composer. His best known work is the 1931 five movement orchestral suite, The Grand Canyon Suite. Evocative of the Old West, the music has been heard not just in countless live performances, but also on radio, television, in amusement parks, and films numerous times. Grofay also wrote original music for films, including 1944's Minstrel Man, which earned him an Academy Award nomination, 
and Rocket Ship XM, which was one of the first film scores to use the electronic instrument the theremin, now a hallmark of the sci-fi sound. As an orchestrator, Grofe is also famous for orchestrating George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. He lived to be 80. Continuing down this corridor, we reach a columbarium on the right. Way up near the top is the niche of Paul Byrne. He was a writer, director, and producer of films, principally in the silent era. These included several Polonegri films, like Lily of the Dust and Flower of Night. Paul Byrne would also help champion Jean Harlow early in her career. The two would eventually marry in 1932, becoming tabloid darlings. But the headlines would turn tragic just two months later, when Byrne was found dead in their home with a gunshot wound to his head. He was 42. His death was ruled a suicide, with a note found nearby. But doubts persist to this day about the official finding, with some speculating that the suicide had been staged, that he had been shot and killed by his common-law wife, who the very next day committed suicide by jumping from a boat on the way to San Francisco. Jean Harlow could not speak of Byrne's death for the remainder of her life. Back out to the grounds, the section just in front of the mausoleum is Magnolia. Here is the grave of Hoot Gibson, beloved cowboy of the world. He was another of early Hollywood's pioneering cowboy heroes. He began appearing in silent westerns as early as 1910. By the 20s, he was second only to Tom Mix as box office draw for western stars. He was particularly popular amongst children who idolized Hoot as their matinee hero. He successfully transitioned into the talkies, and by the 50s, Hoot had appeared in more than 200 films. He was also a champion rodeo performer, and appeared in his own comics in the 50s. Hoot would be inducted into both the Western Performers and National Cowboy and Western Heritage Halls of Fame. He died from cancer at age 70. Just south is the historic Inglewood Mausoleum. Built around 1911, it was the first community mausoleum constructed in California. It too features beautifully colorful stained glass, snapshots of California landscapes. Like other mausoleums in the area, this one is usually kept locked, but if you'd like to visit, just ask and they'll let you in. There are a couple of famous folks from yesteryear in these quiet halls. Just in from the entrance on the left is Samuel Hines. As an actor, he was very busy in the 30s and 40s, appearing in over 200 films. But he didn't start acting until he was in his 50s. Perhaps his best-known role is that of Pa Bailey in the beloved classic It's a Wonderful Life. Other films include You Can't Take It With You and Son of Dracula. Samuel died from pneumonia at age 73. Back toward the entrance, then right, let's head down near the end of this corridor, where on the left we find the crypt of Thomas Lincoln Talley. He was one of the very early pioneers of the movie business in Los Angeles. In 1902, he opened the very first movie theater in LA, called The Electric Theater. In 1917, he co-founded First National Pictures, which began as an association of theater owners, but expanded into a motion picture production company. First National would sign Mary Pickford and Charlie Chaplin to the first million dollar deals in movie history. The company was eventually acquired by Warner Brothers. Tally lived to be 84. Let's say goodbye to this beautiful mausoleum for now and head back out to the grounds. There are a couple of stars here you'll recognize from our Disney special, like Tiny Klein. The diminutive performer began her career as a circus performer. In 1961, Walt began to look for a performer to wow crowds at Disneyland as Tinkerbell, flying over the castle. At the age of 70, Tiny Klein was cast in the role of Tinkerbell, flying over crowds on a wire from Sleeping Beauty's castle to the Matterhorn during the fireworks shows at night. She played the role until her death in 1964. The easternmost section in the cemetery is Mignonette. Near the road is the grave of Myrtle Stedman, the actress began appearing in films as early as 1910 and would become a leading lady in the Selig Studio Western and Action films. Moviegoers fell in love with her as the girl with the pearly eyes. Her star continued to rise into the 20s, 
in films like Reckless Youth and The Famous Mrs. Fair. Into the talkies, her roles were generally more supportive, and as happened to so many, her career declined. She was just 52 when she died from a heart attack. Near the southern end of this section is one of the few upright monuments in Mignonette, an angel marking the Fazenda family plot. Behind this statue is the grave of Louise Fazenda. She was one of the most popular comedians of the silent era. Louise began appearing in two real comedies in 1913, and soon was a key player in Max Sennett's Keystone Comedies. She was known particularly as a character actress, her most famous creation being a country bumpkin with multiple pigtails. In the 20s she made films like The Bat and The Galloping Fish, and made a smooth transition into the talkies, parlaying her knack for character work in films like Tilly's Punctured Romance and Alice in Wonderland. By the end of her career in 1939, she had amassed nearly 300 credits to her name. And if you've ever visited Hollywood Forever Cemetery, this fountain will be familiar to you. It's known as Morning, Noon, and Night. It was created in 1928 for the opening of the Columbarium Rotunda. The fountain features three nymphs. The model for the nymphs was none other than Louise Fazenda. She died from a cerebral hemorrhage at age 66. Proceeding southwest, we avoid smashing into a backhoe, then reach Pinecrest section on the left. In our previous tour here, we visited the legendary Sugar Ray Robinson. Well, not far from Sugar Ray is a noted musician named Floyd Dixon. He was a rhythm and blues pianist and singer who gained popularity in the 50s. His biggest hit in this era was the 1955 track, Hey Bartender. I said, hey bartender, hey man, look here. The talented piano player would share the stage with greats like B.B. King and Ray Charles, even coaching Ray Charles on his vocals. In 1996, he released what is perhaps his most acclaimed album, Wake Up and Live. Floyd died from kidney failure at age 77. Our journey across these sprawling grounds takes us now to the western edge of the cemetery, Sentinella section. Here lies Roy Glenn, a popular character actor known for his deep voice. Roy made numerous appearances in radio, film, and television beginning in the 1930s. One of his best known film roles was as Mr. Prentice, the father of Sidney Poitier's character. In the 1967 film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Other films include Porgy and Bess, Carmen Jones, and his final appearance in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. He made numerous television appearances as well, including on the Jack Benny program and the Amos and Andy show. Roy died from a heart attack at age 56. The next section south is M-Plot. This one takes us all the way to the western fence. Here we find the grave of Big Mama Thornton. She was a blues and R&B singer and songwriter in the 50s. She was the first to record Hound Dog, which was written for her, and would become her biggest hit, spending seven weeks at number one on the R&B charts, years before Elvis Presley recorded it. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Big Mama also wrote and recorded the song Ball and Chain. She continued to perform into the 1980s, but heavy drinking took a toll on her health. She was found dead at age 57 from heart and liver disorders. In 1984 she was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. She was also a featured character in the 2022 biopic about Elvis. Southeast from here is Palm Plot and another one from our Disney special. Here lies Lucille Laverne. She rose to prominence on the American stage, including in the hit play Sun Up, becoming one of the most acclaimed actresses of her day. She appeared in more than 40 films as well, like A Tale of Two Cities, but audiences today perhaps know her best for her voice work at Disney. She voiced the old witch in the silly symphony Babes in the Woods, and in a similar vein provided the voice for the evil queen in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Lucille died from cancer at age 72. A few sections east of here are the Garden of Peace mausoleums. 
This is where Billy Preston is entombed. He was a versatile keyboardist, singer, and songwriter, performing in a wide range of genres from rock to soul and gospel. He backed some of the biggest artists of the 60s, like Little Richard, Ray Charles, The Rolling Stones, and even The Beatles. In fact, he's another artist sometimes referred to as the fifth Beatle, playing keyboards on The White Album, Abbey Road, and Let It Be, and was a featured artist on the single Get Back. Billy also found success as a solo artist in his own right, winning a Grammy for the 1971 track Out of Space. Billy died from complications of kidney disease at 59. In 2021, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Doubling back to the north, we reach Los Flores section. Here's another one for you fans of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Scotty Matraw. He began appearing in films in the silent era like The Thief of Baghdad and Come the Talkies appeared in films like In Old Chicago, but audiences today will always remember him as the voice of Bashful in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Scotty lived to be 66. Hopping over to Astor, one section west, is the grave of Joseph Keaton. Joe and his wife Myra performed a vaudeville act as the two Keatons. In 1895 they had a son, also named Joseph, who at only a few years old would join the act, making them the three Keatons. The comedy act was rough and tumble, and their son's ability to safely take a tumble earned him the nickname Buster Keaton. The three Keatons would perform across the country, with the likes of Harry Houdini and W.C. Fields. But cinema spelled the end of vaudeville, and Joe became an alcoholic. Myra left with their children, Buster going on to become one of the great silent comedy stars. Buster supported Joe, giving him roles in his movies, including The General. According to Buster, Joe died after being struck by a car at age 78. His grave remained unmarked until 2018 when Jessica from Silence's Platinum organized a fundraiser and fans donated to have this marker placed. Back in the car we make our way east to El Sereno section. This is where jazz and blues singer Helen Humes is laid to rest. She rose to prominence singing with Count Basie's orchestra in the 30s and 40s. She eventually relocated to California, where she wrote and recorded one of her best-known songs, Be Baba Liba, a hit in 1945. Ooh, Baba Liba. Ooh, Baba Liba. Oh, Baba Liba, love, Liba, love, Liba, love, Liba. After a hiatus in the 60s and early 70s, her singing career saw a revival in 1973, performing at the Newport Jazz Festival. She continued to perform for the next several years until passing away from cancer in 1981. Further south in this same section we find Cornell Gunter. He was another great singer in the rhythm and blues genre, known as a founding member of the popular musical group The Coasters in the late 50s early 60s. They had numerous hits in this era including Searchin', Charlie Brown, and their biggest hit Yakety Yak. Take out the papers and the trash Or you don't get no spending cash Yakety yak Don't talk back Gunter continued to perform into the 90s when his life was cut tragically short when an assailant shot and killed him as he sat in his car in Las Vegas. He was 53 and his murder remains unsolved. Cornell Gunter was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the Coasters in 1987. Park Terrace section is along the eastern edge of the cemetery. Here is a name familiar to you fans of reality stars, Kardashian. Robert Kardashian was an attorney who came to national attention when he represented his friend O.J. Simpson in his 1995 murder trial. He was part of the team of defense attorneys which included Johnny Cochran and Robert Shapiro that got O.J. acquitted for the murders of his ex-wife and Ronald Goldman. O.J. and Robert Kardashian had a subsequent falling out after Kardashian commented publicly afterward that he had doubts about O.J.'s innocence. Robert was married to Kris Kardashian, now Jenner, and had four children with her, Courtney, Kim, Chloe, and Rob. They would become infamous in the world of reality television in keeping up with the Kardashians. But years before his name would become synonymous with being famous for being famous, Robert Kardashian died from cancer at age 59. Our last stops of the day take us back to the southern end of the cemetery and the Manchester Garden Mausoleum. 
Heading into the Chapel of Honor we find another famous figure from the O.J. trial, Johnny Cochran. He was a Los Angeles attorney who led the defense of O.J. Simpson in his criminal trial for murder. Johnny was famous for his theatrical and often rhymic approach to litigation. His efforts led to the acquittal of O.J. Simpson. Cochran represented other high-profile figures such as Michael Jackson and Sean Combs. In 2003, Cochran was diagnosed with a brain tumor. He passed away in 2005 at age 67. Back out to the courtyard, we head to one of the eastern corridors to find the crypt of Juanita Moore, entombed here with her husband, Charles Burris. She was an actress of stage, film, and television. Her performance as housekeeper Annie Johnson in the 1959 film Imitation of Life would earn her an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress just the fifth black actor to be nominated for an Oscar in any category. Many film and television roles followed this success, including in The Singing Nun and The Kid. She lived to be 99, passing away in 2014. As of filming, her name is not on the crypt. Let's head back into the mausoleum and the Sanctuary of Radiance. Here lies Paul R. Williams. He was known as the Architect to the Stars. Over a career that spanned six decades, Paul would design and build homes for stars like Frank Sinatra, Barbara Stanwyck, Lon Chaney, and Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And his public buildings include the Theme Building at LAX, Los Angeles Superior Court, and the St. Jude Hospital. Williams would also design the tomb of Al Jolson, who had been a champion of African American performers throughout his life. Paul Williams died from diabetes at age 85. The scale of this mausoleum is only fully revealed when you head downstairs with seemingly endless corridors of crypts. In Harmony Corridor we find the unmarked crypt of Patrice Holloway. She was a soul and pop singer and songwriter in the 60s and 70s. She found moderate success with her songs in this era, but today is best remembered as the singing voice of Valerie in the 1970s cartoon series Josie and the Pussycats. Patrice's character Valerie was the first female African-American cartoon character to star in a regular TV series. For the real-life soundtrack released for the fictional girl group, Patrice sang lead on many of the songs, including the iconic main theme. Josie and the Pussycats! Josie and the Pussycats! Yeah. As a songwriter, Patrice co-wrote the song You Make Me So Very Happy which would be a pop hit for the group Blood, Sweat and Tears in 1969, and would be featured in numerous television soundtracks, including The Wonder Years and Mad Men. She died after suffering a heart attack in 2006 at age 55. As of filming, her crypt is unmarked. And finally, we head a few corridors down to Glory to find a man whose glory was forged on the baseball field, Doc Ellis. He was a professional baseball player, spending much of his career with the Pittsburgh Pirates as pitcher. With the team, they won five National League Eastern Division titles and the World Series in 1971. Ellis famously threw a no-hitter in 1970 while under the influence of LSD, forgetting he was scheduled to pitch that night. He was able to throw a no-hitter despite not being able to feel the ball or see the catcher clearly. He'd go on to play for a few other teams, including the Yankees, before retiring in 1980. Ellis was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver in 2007 and was placed on the donor list, but passed away in 2008 before a donor could be found. He was 63. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Oh look, it's Ryan and Emma Gosling, all grown up. I guess that makes them Ryan and Emma Geese now. <laughs>